what I behold still my anxious heart Take what I have known and break it all apart For you, my God, are greater still And no sky contains, no doubt restrains All you are, the greatness of our God I spent my life to know To believe that there is nothing left to fear That you are on a high above it all And you, my God, are greater still And no sky contains, no doubt restrains All you are, the great The tears fall plenty from heartache and strain. So if life's journey has you weary and afraid, there's rest in the shadow of his wings. I have walked through the valleys, the mountains and plains. I have healed the hand of freedom. That washes all my stains If you feel the weight of many trials And burdens from this world There's freedom in the shelter of the Lord I have seen The healing hand of God Reaching out And mending broken hearts Taste and see the fullness. 
Zephaniah 317 says, The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. He is mighty to save. Hosanna is two words in Hebrew broken broken up. Yasha Anna. I apologize, I'm not, I don't know Hebrew very well at all really, but those two words mean, Yasha means deliver or save, and Anna is like a beseeching, it's a begging. So it's basically begging, please, like, please save us, God. And that is, that was the cry of the people um, before, as Jesus was going down, going through on the donkey, they were saying, Hosanna, please save us. And in their mind, they were saying, save us from, from the Romans, save us from, from this situation. Obviously, Jesus had bigger plans. And... He wants to save us for eternity, but he also wants to save us now. And he went through too much not to be for not to be for both, for the, the now and for the later. And it's us humbly coming to him for his help, for that please help us, please save us. So I don't know what you have today that you are crying out to God for your please help, for your please save me, whether it's something physically or emotionally or relationally or um, financially, but God is the God who saves. You guys can stand and we're going to start praising his name.
will come near to you. Wash your hands, sinners, purify your hearts, double-minded. And then he goes on in verse 10, says, humble yourselves before the Lord. He will lift you up. That is such an amazing promise of draw near to God. He will draw near to you. The creator of the universe, the master of everything, the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords says, draw close to me and I will draw close to you. Not maybe, not, mm, I don't know. You draw close, he will draw close. That is an amazing promise. I want that. Your love has ravished my heart, taking me over, taking me over, and all I want is to be with you forever, with you forever. Pull me a little close. Take me a little deeper. I want to know your heart. I want to know your heart. Cause your love is so much sweeter than anything I've tasted. I want to know your heart. I want to know your heart.
if you would hear the stories that I've read and people have said where people have stood on the word and it was literally miracles in their life it was a change for themselves and they declare these things over themselves and I don't I might be wrong on this one but it I think it's Joel 3:10 that concept of even though he was feeling weak he said that he was to declare himself mighty in God and sometimes we need to speak things that currently aren't as though they were that's what that's what faith is that's what that hope is Jesus was constantly doing that in his ministry the prodigal son went and thought I can do things my own way I don't need to do this maybe it was someone who said you know what church really hasn't done it for me I don't I don't need church I don't need fellowship God's real how real is he you know I'm just it's better better my way I, I can be independent and went away and as we know the story of the prodigal son it didn't work out well for him he got so far down he said I'd rather just be a servant back at my own parents house back at my own father's house to go from being a son to a servant that, that's a major difference I it's a major change but you know what in verse 19 he was this was his heart moment I'm no longer worthy to be called your son make me like one of your hired men so he got up and went to his father he drew close to his father he went back love this next part but while he was still a long way off his father saw him he was looking he was waiting he knew he was coming back and was filled with compassion for him not hate not revenge not I told you so not you you should be my servant but with compassion he ran to his son threw his arms around him and kissed him and it goes on to say he threw a huge feast a huge banquet for him that's the heart of the father that's the heart that says draw close to me and I will draw close to you he loves us so much yet we walk around and we carry our Bibles but yet are we really getting into the heart are we really taking it and living on it and believing the words that are in this in this word but no matter where we're at we just can come back and his arms are open again his word you just open it up and there it is ready to meet you wherever you're at that's the heart of the father that's the word the word that came down was made flesh he went through all that for that for us Thank you. 
So I run to the Father. Corinthians 1 20 for no matter how many promises God has made they are yes in Christ and so through him the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God Hebrews 10 23 let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess for he who promised is faithful I don't know if you guys know but Donna Freed right now is in the hospital she was having some um, issues with a fever, and they didn't want her to um, have any possible infection. So they had her being, they had her come in. And so I asked her this morning if I could pray as a congregation, if we could all be praying for her. And I just asked her specifically, "What do you want? What is your prayer? What can we amen with you? What can we agree with you in prayer for?" And she just said that God would use the tre- the treatments that she's getting the way that he wants, and that um, there would be no infections. So if you would join me right now in prayer for her. Um, we are standing on the word of God. Uh, the verse that I feel like for her is Isaiah 41.10, which is, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. <clears throat> he will strengthen us, help us, and uphold us with his righteous right hand. So let's pray right now. God, we just thank you. You, we just read those verses that say that you are faithful to your word. You are a God who is faithful. Your promises are yes and amen. So right now we just stand on your word. We just stand on your promises of healing. And we just stand right now for Donna, that you would be her strength, that you would be her help, that you will uphold her. God, we pray against all infections in Jesus' name. We just tell them to go. We rebuke them. We just thank you, God, for how you are giving her peace right now. We just pray, Lord, that you would just take away any spirit of fear and replace it with a spirit of peace and just a courage in her spirit and in her soul, Lord. I pray, Lord, that she would just be such a testimony to the nurses and the doctors that are seeing her. And we just also pray for Dan, Lord, that you would just help him to be her support and that he also would cling to the word, cling to the truth. And we just right now pray for healing for for Donna, Lord. And we just thank you that we can even come together as this group, this body of believers, and all agree. You tell us in Matthew 18, 19, that where two or more agree that that thing shall be done. So God, we come in agreement and we just um, beseech you. Hosanna, save Donna and help her. We just thank you, God, for what you're going to do. Not by might, by power, not by power, but by you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. next song is a new one and if you I just want you to know that you're not stuck to your seat area sometimes we got to step out we got to get out of our comfort zones so if you need to if you want time with the Lord you want to come up here feel free if you want to go back and move don't feel like you're you have to stay if you're not someone that normally raises their hand maybe you want to raise your hands do something different the crazy cycle is doing the same thing expecting different results push out draw close Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness, you have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, you're my help in time. Lord, I can't tell, but 
Before you find your seat this morning, turn and greet each other. Welcome each other here to the worship house this morning.
There's something special about the buzz that is just heard when you say welcome each other. It's such a good sound to hear again in the body of the church, and we're glad that you could be a part of that. If you're watching online this morning and streaming in with us, and you're a regular attender, and we know that there's a number of you that are away this weekend, so we're hoping you're watching and streaming in. If you're a brand new visitor with us, first time watcher, we're glad you're with us, and we welcome you, and we trust that this morning will be a blessing to you, as I pray it is to all of us as we share together this morning in our worship service. A few announcements for us. The first one is this, just a reminder that we are a partner in the Hope 21 outreach that's taking place in September. As a partner, they're asking those churching, churches who are partners to have volunteers participate in various aspects of that event. So if you could go online, check out the Sign Up Genius. There's places for us to volunteer and sign up to be actively involved and engaged with this outreach opportunity that is in the Franconia area, the Souderton area that, that we just want to be a part of and, and pray that God will do a, a miraculous moving uh, in the touching of lives of those who have yet to say, Jesus is a Lord of mine. So that was the first announcement. The second announcement is if you're worshiping with us this morning and you're a first-time visitor or a second-time visitor and you've never stopped at the Welcome Center and signed in and, and filled out a connection card, I would like to invite you to do that. And as you get that card filled out, there's a welcome bag for you. There's a few things in the bag that will bring you more up, maybe familiar with who we are as a congregation, but also there's a gift there for you that you might appreciate if you drink, well, if you go to Wawa. We'll leave it at that. And so I know all of us are affected by that. This morning, I, we have the fortune, if you will, to have Jeff and Libby Hollenbach with us. Jeff is the vice president of the Worm Project. He, is also, he and his wife are also very active members and leaders at the Blooming Glen Mennonite Church. And Jeff is here this morning to represent the Worm Project, as that is our mission project for the month. And so we're inviting Jeff to now come forward and share with us to familiarize us, if we're not already, what the Worm Project's about and what uh, we might continue to do to help and bless that ministry. Jeff. Thank you, Jay. It's uh, really wonderful to be with you again. And I uh, really appreciate the spirit that's here this morning. The worship time has been uh, uh, truly, truly amazing. And uh, it's beneficial, certainly, for my wife and I. So thank you for, for giving us a few minutes. I'm going to transport your minds, if I can, from Lansdale um, to uh, the equator. All right? So we're going we're gonna to talk for just a couple minutes about ideas that really we don't think about very often. Uh, it's called the Worm Project. I know many of you are familiar with this. I'm going to go through just some of the details of, of who we are. We are part of the Mosaic Mennonite Conference. Um, this, uh, it, our, our goal is to help prevent malnutrition in children by providing medicine to eliminate um, parasitic worms. So that's just an idea we really don't think about very much in this area. It has to do with climate, but parasitic worms are an issue around the equator. We purchase deworming medicine in large quantities of a million tablets or more, donate this uh, medicine to in-country partners, and then they, they um, distribute to various places throughout the world. We are um, an all-volunteer group. Uh, um, I serve on a board. I love the people on our board. There is hardly any overhead. So in terms of, I'll say, bang for the buck, in terms of ministries, and I saw your ministry list out there by your world map, and I love your, your ministry partners. You really have this. It's a great group of ministries that you support. And we're one of those when we're thankful for that. Um, but we um, really have very little overhead. Money goes right to uh, these children. They're, the problem is there are over 800 million children in need of treatment for worms, uh, parasitic worms. Almost one-third of these children are not getting any treatment. The problems, and this is a little um, difficult to think about, but it's reality, right? So um, people, some people throughout the world do not have proper toilets, proper sanitation. Uh, there's adult female worms that get inside these children, and then they're passed through their feces. Um, children become infected by swallowing the eggs. 
It's really hard to think about this. Um, found in contaminated water, it could be vegetables not properly prepared, um, the dirt children play in with their fingers, that gets in their mouths, and these uh, parasitic worms are, are transmitted that way, unfortunately. Roundworm, hookworm, and whipworm are some of the main types of these worms. That's a picture of a roundworm. Um, this is how they affect children. The worms cause physical cognitive impairment to children essentially due to the malnutrition. The worms get the nutrition, the nutrients from the food, uh, the children's bodies do not. And so you see pictures of, of how that's demonstrated in those children. This is a really difficult slide to look at, but those are actual worms. And that can be um, more than 100 parasitic worms in one child. This was taken from a child uh, in Kenya. The impact of deworming uh, can be amazing. You see in this picture, it's either a mother or a grandmother uh, on the left there with her, with her uh, child or grandchild. And then a year later, you see that beautiful child uh, with her smile um, after she received deworming treatment. I had the privilege a number of years ago to be in Honduras with uh, Healthy Ninos. And uh, that's, that's a picture in a school in back hills of Honduras. Um, albendazole is the name of the medication we give, and it was such a privilege of mine to be able to give, to hand that albendazole out. You can't see the smile on the face of that child, but they really know they need this medication and are very thankful for it. In 2020, Worm Project purchased um, a medicine to treat over 4 million children, which does sound like a lot, and we're very grateful for that, but it's really low. COVID obviously has imp impacted all of us at many levels. It certainly impacts ministries. And um, so we are, you know, hoping to ramp that up. Uh, and it's why, why we're here today. It really is just about fundraising uh, to give to these, um, uh, to get, you know, the medication to these, to these children. One deworming tablet costs just a few pennies, uh, and the recommended treatment is once um, every six months. So thank you for allowing me to be here today. Uh, this verse from Matthew 25, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And I would just encourage you to, uh, to join with us in really, really an important ministry. Wormproject.org um, is certainly an easy way to, to get to us. I also have pamphlets and envelopes if you want to have conversation after the service. Um, that would be wonderful. And again, thank you for, for giving us some time. Uh, we really, really do appreciate it. Jeff, before you find your seat, let's have a word of prayer over the awesome. ministry and over the, the leadership at the Worm Project. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, we watch and see how you are moving in miraculous ways throughout the world, throughout our communities, throughout our individual family lives. Lord, we especially now lift up to you the Worm Project mm -hmm. and its leaders. Amen. We pray, Lord, for its guidance as you would oversee that which is taking place. Thank you, Lord, for the many volunteers that are committed to serving you in this way. Mm -hmm. And Lord, I pray that you would continue to bless the funds that come, that it can continue to purchase these pills to be a, a significant and substantial changing effect in the lives of so many millions of children throughout the world. Mm -hmm. But Lord, not only will they be physically changed, but I pray, Lord, that the love that they experience and feel as a result of this outreaching ministry, Lord, that they will also see and find the joy of knowing you in a personal relationship mm -hmm. because of what this organization is doing mm -hmm. on behalf of your kingdom and its work. We pray this in Amen. Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good night, Jay. Okay, I'm going to now ask if ushers could hand out to us an affirmation ballot. We talked about this a number of weeks already, and the expectation was this, that Demas Pizzato had been here two weeks ago, and he candidated as a possible associate pastor with us. We asked you to meet him and participate in that morning service. There was a picnic that followed in the afternoon. Many of you had an opportunity to at least engage with him at some level. And this morning we are looking to actually take a, an affirmation ballot and invite you to complete it. We have a number of ballots that have already been received as a result of a number of you letting us know that are watching online, hopefully, that you were going to be away this weekend. And so you had opportunity to fill out a ballot already. 
We have those results and we will look to compile the results that we get this morning. And hopefully at the end of this service, we'll be able to come forward up, up with information to say the, out, the outcome, the result of our affirmation ballot submission that we have this morning ends up in this particular result. I would like to just read the recommendation that's being given and shared this morning from the elder team. It says this, the elders unanimously recommend Reverend Demas Pizzato to join our pastoral staff as our full-time associate pastor with a focus on youth and other ministries for a two-year term effective, provided it's an affirmation takes place, which we're hoping that you all are at a place that we can make that happen, uh, effective July 1, which is like four days from now. So we're, we're asking for that affirmation. The elders are also recommending Logan Huntsberger to join our staff as a halftime worship director for a two-year term effective September 1st of 2001. So now at this time, I hope everyone has received a ballot. If you have a, an opportunity to fill that out, we'd like to collect them also. So if you have a pen or a pencil, please take them out. And this is not your first notice of getting this, so hopefully you're prepared for it and you're able to complete it like now and uh, we'll collect them and then uh, I'll invite Steve to come forward and share the message with us this morning. And we'll be waiting at the sides for these to be passed down the aisle. Thanks, Jay. As you all are finishing that up, let me uh, pray for us one more time this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that we've sung about this morning, all that we've heard about uh, the ways you're working in our world this morning, and we thank you for the plans that you have for us here at Covenant. And now as we come and open your word, Lord, I pray that you would just speak to us this morning, touch our hearts by your spirit and by your word, not mine, but by your words. Let it be challenging and encouraging and inspiring to us that we might become more and more the people that you made us to be for the sake of your name and your glory. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So when I was in high school, I had a friend who was good at everything. It seemed like there was nothing he couldn't do and nothing that he didn't know. And I knew he was good at everything because he told me so repeatedly. Like this was always a topic of conversation about how experienced he was and how skilled he was and how he was an expert on all sorts of different topics. And maybe you've known somebody like this in your life, somebody who just has a very high level of what we'll call self-confidence, right? Just seems to always be one up above everybody else. And this was kind of an interesting thing in our friend group. Because overall, this guy was a good guy. He was really a decent person. He was kind, but it was really hard to have a conversation with him. Because whenever one of us would talk about something we were trying for the first time or an experience that we had or something that we had learned, he immediately jumped in there and talked about, about how much better he was at that thing or how much more he knew about that thing or, or the experience that he had had that was better. There's a comedian, a guy named Brian Regan, who calls people like this me monsters. He says that in conversation, they have to make it all about themselves. And I've always wondered why certain people do this, right? Is it, is it insecurity? Is it, is it a need for validation? Because what I found was, honestly, while my friend was extremely self-confident, it did not end up very well for him oftentimes. Because often his overestimation of himself made things a lot harder for him. He, he would hype himself up and then not be able to live up to the, the hype that he had given for himself. And it broke down his relationships. And so I always kind of wondered, like, what was going on with that? Now, my friend is an extreme example. But all of us have a tendency to do this at some level, right? Right? All of us have a tendency to, to want to elevate ourselves, to lift ourselves up. And all of us have a tendency to overestimate ourselves at times. And that can be a really detrimental thing to our lives. This morning, we are continuing our series that we're calling Wisdom for Life, where we are looking at the book of Proverbs in the Bible 
and what it tells us about wisdom, how to not just live, but how to craft a life, to live a well-crafted life, to be artisans of life. And in order to do that, we have to talk about two things that Proverbs spends a lot of time talking about. We have to talk about pride and humility. Pride and humility. And so as we we begin this morning, I just want you to take a minute, and and if you want to jot something down about this, if you're taking notes, if you just want to think about this in your mind, I, I want you to think about how you would define pride and humility. What does it mean to be a proud person, and what does it mean to be a humble person? Because our culture has ways of talking about these things and these concepts, and you may not be able to find a particular worded definition, maybe your definition as well, I just know it when I see it, but we want to make sure that our definition of these doesn't primarily come from our culture, but comes from the Bible, because I think while our culture gets some things right about pride and humility, it misses some very key central aspects of what these things really are and how they really work in our lives. So we're going to delve into the book of Proverbs on these two topics, which often go together, and we're going to start by looking at three principles that Proverbs talks about when it comes to pride and humility, three themes that show up over and over again in this book. They're not the only things that Proverbs says about pride and humility, but they're three central ones. And then out of that, we're going to try and come up with a biblical definition of what pride and humility really are and kind of see how it compares to our definitions of this. All right, everybody with me? So that's kind of our plan for this morning. Just a quick note, normally I have you take your Bible out and say, hey, follow along with me. We are going to be jumping all over Proverbs this morning. Um, and so if you're trying to follow along, I think you're just gonna, your head's going to be spinning. So if there was ever a moment to follow along on the screen, I'm going to encourage you to do that. And, and in case for some of you who, who might think I'm not flipping through a lot of pages here, it's going to be hard for me to flip back and forth through Proverbs. So I actually printed out all of my scriptures on a list this morning that I'm going to be referring from. So if it's weird to you that I'm not standing up here and just reading from a Bible, that's why. Don't let that bother you so much. So let's talk about three principles that Proverbs addresses when it comes to pride and humility. Three contrasting principles. The first is this. Pride values stubbornness, while humility values teachability. Pride values stubbornness, while humility values teachability. Let's look at some verses about this. Proverbs 13.10. Where there is strife, there is pride, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. Proverbs 12, 15, the way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. And Proverbs 19, 20, listen to advice and accept discipline, and at the end you will be counted among the wise. So if you're a prideful person, you're going to think that your own way is the right way and you're going to be stubborn, but if you're humble, you are going to accept advice and discipline and instruction. You're going to have a teachable spirit. And I actually find that this is one of the best ways to kind of assess whether we are humble or not, is how teachable we are. I had a couple of friends who years ago decided to uh, take a trip camping up in the Poconos. It was about two hours from where they lived. And so the one guy had been to this particular campground, which wasn't a very popular spot, but he had been there before one time, and so he decided, oh, I'm going to drive and I'll get us there. And my other friend had just bought a a GPS device. This was before we had like Google Maps on our phones, and you actually had devices. Anybody remember those? I know it seems so obsolete now, but you actually had like a little device. And so the other friend said, hey, I'll bring this with us to help guide us. And the first guy was like, no, 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 no. I know where we're going. And so they take off, and and the guy driving starts taking all these turns, and the GPS device is just like yelling at him, like recalculating, recalculating every time he takes a turn. And finally, the guy driving was like, dude, can you shut that thing off? It's driving me nuts. And the guy in the passenger seat says, okay, he turns it off. 45 minutes later, you can tell the guy in the driver's seat sweating a little bit, and he's like, listen, I'm not sure where we are can you maybe turn the GPS on and just see if we can get our bearings here? The guy in the passenger seat says, sure, he turns it on. The guy in the driver's seat says, how close are we? Are we like an hour away? 
The guy in the passenger seat says, no, it says we are two and a half hours away from the campsite. The guy driving it got them so lost that they were further away from when they started. And that's pride, right? You don't want to listen to the GPS. He thought he knew the right way. And that's like the perfect illustration of the difference between pride and humility. And the question is, why do we do this? You had this device there that could get you where you needed to go in record time. See, our natural tendency is to try and prove our value and our worth by being right. By saying, I know the answer to this. I know the right way. I know the direction to go and the choice to make. And so if we want to seem like we have value, we're like, no, I'm going to do this. We stubbornly stick to our guns. I can't tell you how many times I have spent like 45 minutes walking through a Home Depot saying, I'm going to find the item that I'm looking for instead of just like asking the guy in the orange vest in like five minutes, can you show me where this is? I don't want to ask for help. I want to find it myself. And I take extra time to do that. And that's pride. But Proverbs Proverbs tells us that truly humble people seek to learn from others. They're teachable. Because humble people understand that what we don't know is far, far greater than what we do know. That the amount of information and expertise that we do not have is far greater than what we do have. And in order to be wise, we need to ask for help at times. And humility allows us to do that. So the first principle is that pride values stubbornness and humility values teachability. Here's the second principle from Proverbs about pride and humility. Pride leads to collapse. Humility leads to elevation. Pride leads to collapse. Humility leads to elevation. You can go Proverbs 18, 12. Before a downfall, the heart is haughty, but humility comes before honor. Proverbs 11.2, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. And and maybe one of the most famous Proverbs of all, Proverbs 16.18, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. If you've ever heard the phrase, pride goes before the fall, that's where we get that from. And so to be proud ends up leading to collapse, and to be humble ends up leading to us being elevated. That's what Proverbs teaches us. See, the word for pride in ancient Hebrew actually has this idea of being lifted up, of of ascending to a place of importance, but something that we do on our own. And what Proverbs says, what Solomon and the other writers of Proverbs say is that when we do this on our own, our ascent doesn't last very long. And I don't need to convince you of this because we all see this, right? We see people, proud people, fail all the time. I love seeing it in a sports context, right? Every so often you'll see some sort of athlete or sports star just trash-talking another competitor or another team and saying, we're going to blow them out, we're going to destroy them. And almost inevitably, when the game finally happens... The other team, the humble ones who didn't get involved in this, just decimate that guy and that team. We see this all the time. And honestly, like, let's be honest, when that happens, it feels kind of good, right? It's like, yeah, you got what you had coming. You were proud and you got lowered. It feels good when it happens to somebody else. It doesn't feel quite as good when it happens to us. And there's been more than a few times in my life where I've said to myself, hey, I've got this. I am in good shape. I don't have a problem here. And when it actually came time to do what I needed to do, I found out I did not have this. I was not in as good a shape as I thought. But that's the obvious thing, right? Pride going before the fall is the obvious thing. What's less obvious is the counter to this, that humble people are elevated, We don't see these or hear these stories very often because they're often not as dramatic, but I find these stories much more powerful. About 20 years ago, there's a guy named Jim Collins. Some of you in the business world probably know this name. Jim Collins was a a business owner, a consultant, and a researcher, and he brought a team of researchers together to answer one question. What does it take to make a good company 
a great company? What does it take to make a company that's doing okay in their field and their industry, what does it take to make them a leader in their field and their industry? Some, a company that's making a little bit of money to make a massive amount of money. And his research team spent months and years figuring this out. They interviewed CEOs and leaders and managers of hundreds of different companies, and they found 11 companies who had made this move from a good company to a great company. And they wrote all the results of this in a book called Good to Great. It's, it's, it's a pretty good book if you want to check that out. And the question was, what made the difference? What brought this company from being good to great? And after all this research, the team found a single element that made these companies ascend in this way. It was the humility of the leader, the humility of the CEO. That was the conclusion. By the way, not a Christian book or anything. This was just out in the secular world. Here's what Jim Collins says about this in his book. He says, the good to great leaders never wanted to become larger than life heroes. They never aspired to be put on a pedestal or become unreachable icons. They were seemingly ordinary people quietly producing extraordinary results. When we're humble, it actually leads us to be elevated to ascend the way prideful people want to, and to stay there for the long haul. So when we elevate ourselves, we end up falling, but when we lower ourselves and humble ourselves, then we get lifted up. And this sounds so counterintuitive to us, right? But it seems to go along with something else that another guy in this book said, that if you want to be the greatest, you have to be the least. If you want to be a ruler, you have to be the servant of all. Proverbs says that pride leads to collapse and humility leads to elevation. That's principle two. Principle three, pride results in God's judgment, humility results in God's blessing. Pride results in God's judgment, humility results in God's blessing. Proverbs 6, 16 to 17a, there are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him, and the first is haughty eyes. Proverbs 15, 25, the Lord tears down the house of the proud, but he sets the widow's boundary stones in place. Proverbs 16, 5, the Lord detests all the proud of heart. Be sure of this, they will not go unpunished. Here's the deal. You cannot read the book of Proverbs. You cannot read through this book, or, or if some of you are still doing this, and I know some of you are maybe hand-copying this book. Maybe you've noticed this. You cannot go through the book of Proverbs and not see that God absolutely hates pride. It's not that he just thinks it's a bad thing. God despises pride. In fact, in this Proverbs 6 passage, there's a list of seven things that it says that God hates, and the very first one on that list is haughty eyes, arrogant vision, pride. It's above unrighteousness, immorality, injustice. All those find themselves lower in the list, but the first one is pride. And the reason for this is because pride is the thing that leads to all those other things. It's pride that leads us to do wicked, evil things. It's pride that leads us to harm others and ourselves. Pride is the source of this because when we become proud, that's when we believe that the rules no longer apply to us, that we can do whatever we want, that we have everything in hand. I mentioned before that over the past few years in the church world, we have seen just people who are elevated into high positions of leadership in churches fall over and over and over again. Big name pastors and ministry leaders who wrote books and had conferences time and time again ended up falling because of things like sexual immorality or abuse or mismanagement of funds or bullying and abusive tactics among their staff. And the commonality among all of these leaders was pride because they at some point believed that the rules no longer applied to them. They could cross uncrossable lines. They could push the envelope. And so pride results in God's judgment. It just does. But the opposite is also true. 
that the humble are blessed. And I just want to take a quick moment to look at uh, this Proverbs 15, 25 verse, where it says, the Lord tears down the house of the proud, but he sets the widow's boundary stones in place, which is kind of a weird illustration. Like, what do widows have to do with being humble, and what about boundary stones? Well, see, in the ancient world, nobody was more humble than a widow, not because widows were special, especially ethical or moral people, but just out of necessity. Widows were totally dependent on other people and God. They had no status in society whatsoever. And the boundary stones that Solomon talks about here have to do with marking out the land that the widows were able to own. This still happens in the world today, where after a widow loses a husband or family members, often other people will try and come in and steal their land, leaving them destitute and poor. And so when God says that he sets the widow's boundary stones in place, it means that in humility he provides protection and provision for the most humble in society, that they could survive and thrive, have safety and security in their land. And so God's blessing doesn't always mean a greater paycheck or a promotion or things like that. Often it comes down to just having the confidence of God's presence and his compassion. So pride results in God's judgment and humility results in God's blessing. So here are three principles. Pride values stubbornness, humility values teachability. Pride leads to collapse, humility leads to elevation. And pride results in God's judgment, and humility results in God's blessing. And you might wonder, okay, but how does this give us a definition of pride and humility? When we look at these three things that Proverbs shows us, we start to see a pattern. Because to be humble is to admit that I don't know everything. To seek to be elevated through humility says that I'm not enough on my own. And to acknowledge that humility leads to God's blessing is to acknowledge that I don't get to make the rules. God does. I don't know everything. I'm not enough on my own, and I don't make the rules. As a God, opposed to God who does know everything, who is enough and who provides enough for everyone and who does make the rules. See, all of these things belong to God, not to me. That's what humility is. So think about your definition of pride and humility for a second, and I want to give you the, what I think is the Bible's definition of pride and humility. Here you go. Pride is when I live like I am greater than God, and humility is when I live like God is greater than me. Pride is when I live like I am greater than God, and humility is when I live like God is greater than me. And if you had God in your definition of what pride and humility are, you get bonus points this morning. Because most often when we think about pride and humility in our culture, it doesn't start with the idea of God. It starts with either the idea of myself or other people. So for instance, pr pride is a self-understanding, right? Pride is about how great I think I am, and humility is how low I think I am. Or pride is how I compare myself to others. Am I better or worse than them? And pride and humility do show up in these areas, but what Proverbs tells us over and over again is that the source of pride and humility has to do essentially with how I relate to God first and foremost. And so if we're going to seek to be humble people, and hopefully after those three principles, you're thinking you want humility and not pride. I'm guessing we all do. If we want to be wise in humility, we have to start with our relationship with God. Because pride is essentially putting myself in God's place, saying that I get to be in charge. I'm the person who is central here. Pride at its core is self-idolatry. Pride at its core is self-idolatry. Worship of myself. But humility is acknowledging God's rightful place, that he gets to be in charge. Humility is true self-awareness, that I am not God, only God is God. 
And the interesting thing here is that this goes beyond just how we think of ourselves. In fact, it's more centered in how we live. See, nobody actually thinks that they're greater than God. That might come as a shock to you, but, but nobody really thinks that, not even atheists. Atheists don't believe that there is a God to be greater than, so they can't think of themselves as greater than God. Agnostics, people who aren't sure whether God exists, they're not sure if God exists, but if he does, I'm guessing they don't think that they're greater than God. And most of us would not worship a God that we think that we're greater than. It's not primarily a mental issue that we have. It's a lifestyle issue. Because we can think that God is greater than us, but live in such a way as if we are greater than God. We can make choices and decisions that put ourselves in the center instead of putting God in the center. And so the heart of understanding pride and humility is understanding this relationship with God. And when we get this right, this changes how we view ourselves and others, how pride influences our understanding of ourselves and our relationship with others. Because there's a couple of ways in our culture and society we get humility specifically wrong. First, we get it wrong by thinking that humility is about thinking less of myself, right? As a musician, I experience this all the time. If you've ever gone to a a musical performance or, or, or some sort of play or show or something like that, and you've seen something really amazing happen, Maybe like an artist or or a musician will get up and play something just immaculately beautiful, and you go and see them after the the concert, and you say, that was incredible. You are such an outstanding musician. The natural tendency is to say, oh, no, 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 I'm not. No, 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 that was just, uh, I was just doing a little thing here, right? We like to downplay that. We don't like accepting compliments. We think lowering ourselves is the humble thing to do, but that's actually false humility, to pretend like we don't have gifts and talents that God has actually given us. See, the really humble thing is to say, well, thank you for that. But the source of my talent is the God who made me. And I play for his glory, and he's the one who deserves the honor for this. It's not saying that I'm less than I really am. It's directing the attention and the praise back to God. That's true humility. So humility isn't actually thinking less of myself. Likewise, in my relationship with others, we get this wrong by thinking that humility is about comparing myself to other people, right? So other people have to be greater, so I have to be less, right? If, if, I, if I'm humble, then I think everybody else is better than me at things. But again, That doesn't have to be true. I can be better at something in one area and not in another area. The fact is true humility isn't about comparing myself with others. It's about comparing myself with God. And God is always greater than me. And when we do that, it actually allows us to do what the Apostle Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2 in a very famous passage where he says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Note what Paul doesn't say here. He doesn't say, in humility, lower yourself as compared to others. He says, no, value others above yourself. Lift them up. That's the point. When I'm comparing myself primarily to God, I can lift others up without having any insecurity about that because I know who I am and I know who God has made me to be. Seeing pride and humility in relationship with God leads to humility with ourselves and with others. And the beautiful thing about this passage in Philippians 2 is that it actually gives us the full reason why we should be humble, the perfect example of humility. And I'm just going to read this. I'm not going to put this up on the screen because it's such a famous passage, but here's what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5. He says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. 
Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The most remarkable thing that ever happened was that the single being who never needed to ever worry about being humble about ever anything, God decided to humble himself and become like one of us. And not only that, but he humbled himself in the person of Jesus to death, to die on our behalf. But not just any death, to die the most humiliating death that has ever been devised by humankind, death on a cross. The reality that our God went from the, the very, very top to the very, very bottom, also that we who are sinners could be forgiven of our sin, to be invited into a relationship with this God, and to be given the promise of life and eternity. And because Jesus did that, it says that God has lifted him up to become the name that is above every other name. So listen, this morning, I just want you to know that this is the God that loves you. It loves every single person in this room that invites you to a relationship with him that wants you to live lives of wisdom, of humility. And if you've never given your life to this God, to this Savior, this person, Jesus, I want to encourage you to do that because nobody could ever love you more than this God loved you by going from the very top to the very bottom, by humbling himself to death even death on a cross. And if you want to make that decision today, I'd love to talk with you and pray with you after the service this morning. For those of us who have made that decision, we are called to be followers of Jesus. And both Paul and Solomon in Proverbs tells us that wisdom comes from following in the humble footsteps of Jesus. So hopefully by now you're convinced that humility is a good thing, that it's devised in our relationship with God, but we have this question, how? How do we develop humility? How do we become more humble? How do we cultivate this? And there's a problem here, because as soon as we start saying, I want to be more humble, we've already lost. The game is over, right? Because think about the progression of this say, oh, well, I want to I get better at humility. I want to become more and more humble. In fact, I want to become like the most humble person who's ever lived. Game over. You can't do that because it makes it all about me again instead of about God, who is the source of humility. And so the trick is not to focus on ourselves, not to try and build this in ourselves. The trick is to focus on God. And that's what one more verse in Proverbs says. Proverbs 22, 4. It says, Humility is the fear of the Lord. Its wages are riches and honor and life. If you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about what the fear of the Lord really is, which is being overwhelmed by the goodness and the greatness of God. We can't be overwhelmed by our God and not come away humbled by that. We can't help but see ourselves as we really are when we see God as he really is. And so this is the trick to really developing humility. A theologian named Michael Reeves says it this way, the key to humility is not about trying to think less of yourself or trying to think of yourself less, but about marveling more at him. Louis Giglio, who's a pastor some of you know, the pastor of Passion City Church, says it this way, humility is not a character trait to develop. It is the natural byproduct of being with Jesus. So if you want to get more humble, I've got a secret for you. Here's the secret to humility. The secret to humility is worship. If you want to get more humble, here, here it is. The secret to humility is worship. And when I say worship, I mean more than what we just did this morning, more than just singing together 
on a Sunday morning, though that's certainly part of it. But worship, regularly coming to the place of awe and submission before the God who has made us and saved us and rescued us. That's how we become humble. Humility comes from encountering God in all of his greatness and his goodness. So I want to give us a challenge this week on this. The challenge is this this week, that we would all humble ourselves in worship. This week I want us to all humble ourselves in worship. See, it is so easy to go through our days without really considering who God is. It's so easy to go through our our checklists, our to-do lists, our family obligations, our job obligations, and, and wake up in the morning and go to bed at night and not actually take a single second to consider how great our God is. And I know this because I'm a pastor, and I do that too. Even us pastors are susceptible to this. And so I want to challenge us this week to take intentional time each day just to worship God for who He is. Just to to take some time and and focus on His greatness and reflect that back to Him and, and tell God how amazing He is to us and how much we love Him for it. You can do this a lot of different ways. You can use worship music. You can add this as a component to your prayer life. You can spend time just meditating on who God is. You can walk through, you know, the the nature and just allow this to be a reflection of your love for Him. However you choose to do it, but I want to encourage us to be really intentional about this this week, to set aside specific time. It doesn't have to be super long. It can be just five minutes a day. Just five minutes a day. How long? I mean, when was the last time we took five minutes and just said, God, for the next five minutes, I'm just going to tell you how awesome you are. I'm guessing most of us don't do that on a fairly regular basis. And I will say, if if pride is something you're struggling with right now, maybe make it like 10 minutes. That might be not a bad idea. Now, I know some of you actually do do this already, and if that's you this morning, I just want to encourage you, keep going, because this is the source of humility. Humility. It is impossible to spend time encountering the greatness of God and not come away going like, man, I'm so nothing compared to him. And there's nothing more freeing than that in our lives. And as we do this, I want to encourage us to just see what happens out of this. Watch our perspectives about ourselves and our relationships with others begin to shift. Because we really do believe that God will lift up those who are humble before him. So this week, let's spend some time humbling ourselves in worship before God. And when we do that, I think we'll find that we become a lot less like my friend in high school who was good at everything. And we start to look a little bit more like the Savior who humbled himself to death on a cross. And then when people see him in us, They'll want to know that Savior too. Because at the end of the day, it's not all about me and it's not all about you. It's all about Him. And to understand pride and and humility is to understand that it's all about Him. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank You that You did not consider equality with the Father something to be used to your advantage but that you humbled yourself for our sake to the most humiliating death that has ever been devised by human beings that you did this so that we could have relationship with you and so that we could experience what it means to be humbled before you to live wise lives of humility Lord, I pray that you would just guide us and direct us to worship this week. Give us a passion for it. Give us a desire to spend time honoring you for who you are so that we could be more like you in humility. We pray this in your name. Amen.
stand up and join.
Thank you all for being with us this morning, for spending this time worshiping our great God, and hopefully just by being a little bit more humble than we came in. Um, I want to share the results of the affirmation ballot, the combination of online ballots we received before this morning and the ones that you all filled out. Uh, Demas Pizzato has been affirmed with 97% of the congregational vote, and Logan Huntsberger has been affirmed with 100% of the congregational vote. So on behalf of us, as, yeah, we can applaud for that. That's great. On behalf of myself, Pastor Jay, our elders, and especially our search committee that put a lot of time into helping us through this process, I want to thank you all. Can we all just thank the search committee as well? Like in our, because they did a ton of work to make this happen. So Demas will be starting this Thursday on July 1st, and we are excited to have him here, and you will start to see him and his wife and their baby next Sunday. Uh, let me pray for us as a church, and then I'll dismiss you to go. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you both for Demas and Logan that you have called them to this congregation. We pray your blessings on them as they begin to pursue this new role here at Covenant, Lord. And we pray that you would continue to guide us and lead us into the future that you have for us as we seek to reach out to our community and our world with the hope that you offer to everyone. Go with us now as we leave this place that we would honor and glorify you in all that we do. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.